Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North all talking about rights, the white man gonna be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches, and to have the best place everywhere. <laughs> Nobody ever helps me into carriages <laughs> or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as any man when I could get it. And I could bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have born 13 children, seen most sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? And they talk about this thing in the head. What is it they call it? Oh, that's, that's right, yeah, intellect. <laughs> that's it, honey. Well, what's that got to do with women's rights and Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint, and y'all holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? That, that man in the back there, he says, women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Well, where did your Christ come from? <laughs> where did your Christ come from? He came from God and a woman. Man didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, well, these women here together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And they asking to do it. The men better let them. Welcome. This is Majesty Sussex Report. I'm Antonio. Thank you for spending some of your valuable time here with us. I want to start out today's episode by just saying thank you. Thank you to women, but especially to Black women. Today, as we reflect on Sigourney's truth, powerful words in And I, a Woman, we are reminded of the generations of Black women who have been the backbone of justice, wisdom, and resilience. With common sense and bravery, they've shouldered the burdens others would not bear, stood tall where others would not stand, and led with a fierce love for truth and equality. From Sigourney's time and even before hers to today, Black women have been doing the work speaking truth, fighting for equality, and building communities with compassion and courage. We see you, and we honor you. Thank you for your tireless strength, your unwavering wisdom, and your endless contributions to a world more just, and more humane. We stand with you shoulder to shoulder, inspired by you, and ready to continue this journey with you. I thank you.
Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Since we spoke last, I think, before the elections, I really had a bit of a conversation in regards to the Royals. Where were we? Should we do a little recap? I mean, first and foremost, we had the Sunday Times that came out with telling us that actually the Prince and the King, they actually own Britain with all the properties that they've got and they're making millions. Yes, millions. They're making off the backs of working class people. Well, not just working class, everyone. Then we had that um, tour of Australia and Samoa and a quick stop over in India in order to, you know, rejuvenate. Rejuvenation. And as per all of the royal rotas, the tour was a success. I mean, an absolute success. Not taking into consideration, of course, that the wife of the king showed up a little bit maybe wasted because she started a whole new way to do that, you know, shaking hands thing. <laughs> the walk about or walk around or walk with it has got a new name. It's called the Camilla. Okay. So with the Camilla walk, you just don't look at people. You just stick your hands out <laughs> as if you're doing a high five. <laughs> Don't look at them because, come on, there is no sense in royalty looking at poverty or, or, or commoners. So you just stick your hands out and you walk and you walk and you walk. Okay, that's called the Camilla walkabout. And then, of course, we had in Parliament, a senator, Lydia, who just expressed with her own voice as a representative of her people how they felt about the monarchy. Then after that, you know, the king was invited to this event in his honor. He showed up for five, maybe ten minutes and then just said, I've had enough. I need to go. Bye bye. And he left. Then to show that she really, 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 really felt in touch with the common folk in Australia, the king's wife took her shoes off and she walked bare feet, showing the people of Australia and everyone around the world that she didn't care about breaking any royal protocols, that she. She is a modern woman. There you go, Meghan Markle. What do you have to say, Meghan? Who is closer to the people now? Uh, uh, of course, it's the king's wife. I mean, she couldn't get any closer to the people than her feet, bare feet on the ground. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoying the soil of Australia. Oh boy. And it gets better. <sighs> the king is obviously tired, tired, tired. So he's falling asleep when people are talking too long or dancing too long. So they left Australia and said, bye bye, suckers. Now, according to the Royal Rhoda, <sighs> Britain can rest assured that Australia will not be a republic. Everywhere the king and his his wife his, 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 no, his wife, right? Yeah, his wife went. They were received by thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people. Australia will remain in the fold. Thank you. Off to Samoa. So, local people giving the welcome, stood in the rain, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> it rained and it rained, and people <laughs> just had to wait there in the rain. Then the special guests arrive. 
and someone had let me see the giggles i mean the king kind of closed his eyes ever so often because he was like all right so i'm tired so i'm just gonna close my eyes and pretend like i am really indulging in the music and the dance and the traditions but let's only count to 10 because if i go beyond 11 i will fall asleep in the meanwhile his wife is sitting right next to him was like <laughs> i mean some of the people who were present were like where is that witchy kind of laughter is coming from? But then a spell was cast and no one heard the laughter after. Because you see, the wife of the king took her fan, put it in front of her mouth so it can disguise the sound of her <laughs> laughter. Because her dis I mean, respect, respect, yeah, that's what it was, respect for other people's cultures is legendary. Absolutely legendary. Because everywhere she goes, everywhere she goes, everywhere she goes, her demonstration of respect for other people's culture is legendary so with all that and all this the king said in a very emotive speech of compassion that he hopes that he has a long life and he will be returning back again many 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 times and your majesty we wish the same for you to have a very long long life because after you oh boy yeah really oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy now everyone was so stressed out so stressed out so they said goodbye to the commonwealth people blah 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 ta 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 the concert, also known as the wife, she couldn't leave fast enough. I mean, she ran up the stairs of the plane and said, suckers, goodbye. She couldn't stand to, 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 to hold or shake another person of color hand or look at their silly dances or the silly speeches they give or whatever. I mean, if they're not bowing down or on their knees or, I don't know, curtsy with their heads down, she is not interested. Okay? Okay. Now, they got on the plane and Miss Thing, also known as the king's wife, also known as the concert, the mistress, the tampon lady, she said, darling, 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 I'm talking to you. And he said, yes, mommy. Yes, mommy, what do you want, mommy? She said, I need to go to India and replenish my BOJ. So, the pilot said, This is pilot control, pilot control, pilot control, go to India, uh, flight for the flight for the flight for the flight I don't know what the pilot said, I didn't quite understand, but they went to India to be replenished. I wonder with what? Hmm. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Hmm. Anyways, on their return, they returned, and then we get the son, the eldest son of the king, who then flew off just in time to South Africa. South Africa! Yes, baby! Yes, baby! And off went the heir to the throne. To South Africa, South Africa, where once arrived, he was conveniently pictured coming down the stairs of the plane, looking very much 
Hmm. Megan-esque or Harry-esque? I mean, the heir carrying his own little carry-on. Very businessy looking, very ready to be in charge. Well, I guess he's taking a page out of Harry's and Megan book as to how to really be a royal in touch with the people. Well, the welcome was exuberant. What? What? Why was he there? Oh, 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 yes, of course. He was there to promote, to hand out the prizes for the, what's it called again? I don't know. What's it called? The prize shot? The earth shot? The earth did something? Oh, yes. Earth shot prize. Yes, that's it. Do you folks even know how do you get the prize or how do you win? Let me tell you. So, there are five categories, okay? One, two, three, four, five. In those five categories, they search and they look for people around the world who may qualify in those five categories. They nominate those people. Those people then may or may not attend. Well, they didn't really attend it the last few prize earth shot thingies because there wasn't enough money for it. You see, they had enough money to fly in celebrities and stuff, but not the people who were nominated. Anyways, I digress. So they nominate these people and the prize is given out in a big spectacular. Spectacle, 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 right? And it's like the Oscars, but for the environment. And they're given this award. Now, I must say that there was no cause to spare in this new rollout of, you know, the new image of the air. He was seen doing everything possible from football to rugby, to sports, to in the ocean, off the ocean, on a beach, off the beach, greeting people, laughing with people, smiling with kids, not smiling with kids, every single possible thing. He was seen doing it because this is the prince that cares. This is the prince that's connected to the people. And if all of that was not enough, we are told that the prince is going to be meeting the president of South Africa. And this is definitely another example of the evolution of William as a global statesman. Of course it is, according to <clears throat> William's office. Now we head over to the president's office and they issued a statement and that statement said that the president will be meeting with the prince as a courtesy a courtesy call from the prince of wales not really um okay that's kind of embarrassing oh but listen we've got celebrities 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 now <clears throat> William got his homeboy from Australia, Robert Irwin, you know, homeboy. He also got Winnie, he also got Heidi, he also got a whole bunch of other celebrities <sighs> to fly in and to be there. Hang on a minute. Did they pay these celebrities or did they do it out of the goodness of their heart? I'm sure they did it out of the goodness of their heart because they believe in this cause. I'm sure they do. Let's see what Heidi thinks. Heidi! <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. I guess the celebrities were paid for and their trips were paid for and their hotels and stuff was paid for. It's a lot of money that could have gone somewhere else, but who am I to say anything? Anyways, let's wrap that up. Back at the island, you would have thought that, you know, you would hear more about this whole duchy and, 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 
all this stuff that the king and the prince owns and the money that they get from it the millions upon millions of pounds and on top of that they get more money from the sovereign um trust not a thing nada zippo zinch do you ever feel that you're sitting at like the kids table when you deal with these people it's literally like you're sitting at the kids table now just so we can refresh ourselves a little bit and feel a little bit better about let's head over to the adults table and let's see what's happening over there at the adults table well so please so please who do we have here no other than prince harry at the adult table speaking guess to whom so at the grown-up tables prince harry speaks to the NATO commanders or the, 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 the NATO defense ministers. And he talks to them about the importance of Invictus, the Invictus Games, mental health. He talks to them about the importance of what the Invictus game does in regards to morale and all of that. This is what's happening at the grown up table. But you see, the tabloids, instead of talking about that, they decide to, oh, Prince Harry, heartfelt tribute to Meghan Markle spotted during NATO address from home. Prince Harry displays wedding picture with Meghan Markle during virtual appearance at NATO meeting. Prince Harry, NATO appearance reveals beautiful Meghan Markle picture tribute to Meghan. Are these people, they've just lost their sense of everything and anything. This was about NATO. And just because they need to somehow justify all of their stupid articles and headlines about there is a divorce, it's imminent, divorce is happening, they're separated. Oh, they've, we haven't seen Megan in two years. Oh, Harry has disappeared. Oh, Megan doesn't talk to him anymore. To justify their nonsense, a picture that is usually there it wasn't put there on purpose it's there they need to make a big deal out of it but also at the grown-up table and here at again the grown-up table prince harry and megan spoke via video to the first global ministerial conference on ending violence against children in colombia so you see this is at the grown-up table. This is what's happening at the grown-up table. Thank you to both the Colombian and Swedish governments, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Ending Violence Against Children for bringing us all together today. The first ever ministerial conference on ending violence against children comes at a crucial time and, quite frankly, should not be required. But here we are. We are at a crossroads where the urgency to reassess and redefine our approach to protecting children has become increasingly evident. While the necessity has always been apparent, it is now time to translate that awareness into meaningful action. So we thank you all for your attention to this critical issue. My husband and I recognize today's reality is marked by greater connectivity and advanced technology, which of course has many positives, but which also compels us to better understand how digital violence against children is manifesting itself in this age. And at the Archwell Foundation, we engage with young people, families, and experts worldwide, learning how every aspect of a child's life, from their livelihood to their physical and mental well being, now operate within an online economy that has the power to both shape and misshape our connections. While the online world can help develop strategies to protect children from violence, it also introduces new risks, such as from individuals who exploit gaps in outdated legal systems which often don't account for today's digital realities. We know that supporting parents is essential in reducing digital violence against children. That's why earlier this year, we launched the Parents Network, a support network for families dealing with online harm. Through trauma-informed practices, we help parents come together to forge strong bonds, offering healing support through community with the ultimate goal of prioritizing safety at the source. Parents from the Parents Network are sharing their personal stories about their families' experiences with you all this week. We hope their voices and message will reaffirm this room's commitment 
to taking a clear-eyed approach to the reality of violence targeting children in this digital age. The stories have helped us to understand that as we better equip parents and caregivers and work to establish norms around the use of and access to technology as they relate to preventing violence, we must also commit to establishing standards that prioritize children's safety. Young people are calling for help. Families are desperately seeking support. They are urging us to leverage the resources in this room to confront the new reality our youth are facing. We look forward to the actions and outcomes of the discussions that will take place here in Colombia and are grateful for the leadership, expertise and testimonies that will come together in this room to address all forms of violence targeting the most vulnerable in our world. Thank you again for your commitment to preventing violence against children, both offline and online. Together, we can harness this moment to drive lasting change. Thank you. As we mark both Veterans Day and Remembrance Day, I reaffirm my lifelong admiration and appreciation for the service and sacrifice you and your families have made both in times of conflict and peace. You have played a vital role in defending the values of liberty, freedom and security. These values bind us together and have shaped you as leaders and role models. At a time of global uncertainty, remember the unity and purpose that defined your service and do not hesitate to put that into action in your communities. That same spirit should guide all of us in facing today's challenges. Your example and morality demonstrate that true power lies in our ability to unite and confront the obstacles before us. As you continue to serve making valued contributions to communities, colleagues, households and all those we love my hope is that our communities will continue to serve your needs too. Your contributions do not stop because you no longer wear the uniform and the collective sense of appreciation for what you have done for your country should not stop either. Let today be a reminder that the true measure of gratitude is not in words alone, but in our actions and our ongoing efforts to build a world worthy of the sacrifices that those before us have made and to protect it for generations to come. To all those who have served past and present I offer my deepest respect and thanks. Your service has made a lasting, positive impact for our communities, our nations, and our shared future. I am honored to stand with you. Dear Scotty's Little Soldiers, As we approach Remembrance Day, I want to take a moment to reflect on the profound significance of this occasion and what it means for each of you. This day is a time not only to honor the extraordinary sacrifices made by our service members, but also to recognize the impact these sacrifices have on families, especially ones like yours. Each of you carries a unique story shaped by the bravery of a parent who served our country. I understand, perhaps more than most, the weight of losing a parent at a young age. It can be overwhelming and isolating. Yet, in the midst of that heartache, we find strength in the love and memories left behind, and I have seen how communities like yours can offer deep comfort and healing. Scotty's Little Soldiers embodies this spirit of community. In coming together to support one another, you not only honor the memories of your loved ones, but also forge bonds that can and will carry you through the toughest times. The tears and laughter, the shared experiences, and the moments of joy you create together are powerful reminders that love endures. On this Remembrance Day, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the values that your loved ones instilled in you courage, compassion, and a sense of purpose. These will serve as your guiding light, helping you navigate the challenges ahead. As you gather to remember and celebrate, know that you are part of a larger community that stands with you, ready to uplift and support you. Your resilience is a testament to the legacy of your loved ones, and I have every confidence in your ability to make them proud and to shine brightly in the world. All they want is for you to be happy. Two absolutely beautiful letters written by Prince Harry in commemoration of Veterans Day, Remembrance Day. Just absolutely beautiful. Now, zooming back at the kitty table, let's see what kind of um, issues are happening over there. Now, this is June Remembrance Day. On November 9th, the Festival of Remembrance, the annual event which is organized by the Royal British Legion that honors the service and sacrifices of the British and Commonwealth Armed Forces, it was in 
great display of making sure Catherine the Great was okay. The whole pat the lower back and, oh, look, the support that William is giving to Catherine. Catherine bites, you know, sort of, sort, of, sort of takes her lips in words and that is seen as she is so emotional. She's showing her emotions because it's been a difficult year, 2024. Now, also, I thought I heard something about the cancer not being cancer, that the, that that it was just the pre-cancer, but now it's it wasn't ever cancer. I'm just going to leave that for now. Now, rumor has it that on the following day that Catherine wasn't supposed to be there, but because the wife of the king has a chest infection or something like that. Maybe she drank too much of something while she was in India to replenish her beauty and vitality. Not sure. I'm not saying anything. So that she wasn't supposed to be there, but because they do need a senior royal, the only other royal left was going to be the Duchess of Edinburgh. And there were many people saying, oh, gosh, no, we can't have our Sophie be the most senior royal. Therefore, Catherine had to put herself together, lift her face up and all of that. Get ready. So she was the most senior royal there. Now, a comment was made about she looks kind of aged for her age at what? How old is she? 40 something? 42? The 42, she does look aged. Now, and the person who made the comment just asked a question, just said, you know, she looks quite aged for her 42 years old. Is she a smoker? Oh, hold and behold, how dare you ask such a question? The entire royal whatever they want to be called just went at this woman. <sighs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine the censorship? However, if you do say that about Megan, no one cares, right? They wouldn't care. Even though the people who went to this woman are the people saying nonsense about Megan. Double standards? Yeah, I think so too. Now, there was, there was, there was another thing I noticed. that There were times where, you know, the, the Princess of Wales smiled and... and, and you know, looked kind of happy. Wasn't Megan criticized at one point at a Remembrance Day celebration that why is she smiling? She shouldn't be smiling. This is a solemn occasion. Hmm. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Oh, and here we go again with the support and the patting on the back. Sophie so gently and so caringly puts her hand at the back of the Duchess. Oh, 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 pardon me. The Princess of Wales. Oh, this kitty table is getting kind of tired. Can we go back to the adults table, please? Well, here we are back again at the grown ups table. What we've got here uh, Time 100 Climate and uh, Time 100 Climate. Hmm. What is this all about? Oh. Look who we meet at the grown-up table doing grown-up things. Prince Harry. Yes, the Duke of Sussex is in Time 100 Climate 2024. Not only is he in the magazine, in their list of Time 100, but he's in the category of Titan. Do you know what I mean? A, a Titan of Climate change in the list of 100. Let me read you the article, part of the article that Olivia B. Waxman wrote in Times Magazine. The Duke of Sussex supports conservation groups in Africa and says he really became an environmentalist during a trip in 2012 to the Caribbean when a seven-year-old boy told him that England's environmental impact was damaging the coral reefs. 
After that interaction, he was inspired to start Cat uh, Travelist, which is a combination of travel and Catalyst, a nonprofit that provides people booking travel with emissions and other sustainability data so they can consider the lowest impact options. The aim is to help make a dent in the industry's carbon footprint. Tourism makes up about 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Travelist worked with Google to create the Travel Impact Model, a free, publicly available methodology launched in 2022 that predicts per passenger CO2 emissions produced by upcoming flights. Travelist coalition partners representing a combined market value of $3 trillion include top tech companies used by tourists like Booking.com, Expedia Group, MasterCard, Skyscanner, TripAdvisor, and Visa. On September 12, Travelist announced that its flight emission data has appeared in 65 billion search worldwide. Wow. Prince Harry has stressed that sustainable travel also means travel that boasts local economies and support tourism businesses that hire local talent. He summed up Travelist missions at its fifth anniversary celebration in on September 24th during Climate Week. And I quote, as I sought solutions to some of the world's most pressing conservation challenges, I quickly realized just how profound an impact the travel and tourism industry has. Together, we are proving that travel can be a force for good. So let's continue this journey together and make sure that travel benefits everyone everywhere. End of quote. Good King Harry, I'm telling you. Good King Harry. Bravo. Now, do you recognize this, this fellow? Look again. I know you do. Do you recognize him now? Good. So, why are we going to talk about him? This is why. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has announced his resignation following an investigation revealing that he did not immediately report the severe physical and sexual abuse carried out by a volunteer at Christian summer camps. Welby, head of the Church of England and a prominent figure in the Anglican communion, faced increasing pressure to step down after <sighs> after the report highlighted shortcomings in addressing abuse within the church. The report sparked widespread public outrage, leading members of the General Snod, the Church National Assembly, to start a petition calling for Wilby's resignation, arguing that he had lost the confidence of his clergy. In his resignation statement, Wilby expressed, I believe that stepping aside is in the best interest of the Church of England, which I dearly love and which I have been honored to serve. The report findings also intensified calls for justice from those harmed by John Smite or Smith, the individual at the center of the investigation. Smythe, who passed away in 2018, committed extensive abuse against approximately 30 boys and young men in the UK and 85 more across Africa over a span of five decades. The church commissioned report spanning 251 pages characterized Smite as one of the most prolific abusers linked to the church. 
The victims' voices, as well as the broader public response, underscored the urgency for change and accountability within the Church of England, marking Wellby's departure as a significant turning point in its handling of such cases. You know, I'm going to make a, 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 a connection here that some of you may not like, or, or maybe you will think it's a weird way of connecting things, but I'm going to make it. But I'm going to make it in, I think, in last the last word. But for now, when we think, again, I, I, I don't think that they can, there, 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 there isn't a, a pit in hell that these people cannot reach. And still when they reach it, they can even go deeper down. But um, I'll let James O'Brien tell you about, about this part mystery for the morning <laughs> the, the, the daily mail have written an article about justin welby's resignation who do you think they have managed to imply is responsible for his disgrace no, decline for his situation who do you think the daily mail have managed to imply is responsible for justin welby's situation is it A, John Smythe, the serial child sex abuser who Welby stands accused of not properly investigating? Is it B, Boris Johnson, who was prime minister during one of the more relevant periods of Welby's primacy? Or is it C, Meghan Markle, for reasons? So who do you think the Daily Mail today impute some responsibility for jo jo Justin Welby's resignation? Is it A, John Smythe, the actual paedophile? Is it B, Boris Johnson, the actual prime minister for much of this period? Or is it C, Meghan Markle, the actual wife of Prince Harry? I, I, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, isn't it? But you probably think I'm joking. I'm not. How Justin Welby fell under Harry and Meghan's spell as Archbishop of Canterbury resigns over ignoring prolific sex abusers' crimes, how his friendship with the Sussexes raised questions about his judgment. So come here a minute. I told you years ago, right, that there was not a story in the universe that certain members of the media wouldn't try and blame on Meghan Markle. And you thought I was exaggerating. If you'd said to me that day, do you honestly think that if the Archbishop of Canterbury resigns over a child sex abuse scandal, they'll try and blame it on Meghan Markle? Do you know what I would have said? I'd have said, no, all right, maybe not every story. Maybe not every bad thing that happens in the UK could be turned into a story about Meghan Markle. And guess what? I'd have been wrong. Because here is a story about a child sex abuse scandal engulfing the Church of England and uh, prompting the resignation of Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Mail have turned it into a story about Meghan Markle. So if you thought I was exaggerating then, I looked at the camera then, that's how cross I am, <laughs> pointing at it now. If you thought I was exaggerating when I said that these ghouls would turn anything negative into a story about Meghan Markle, then today's the day that you have to apologize. And I, I'll wait, okay? 11.53 is a... I honestly don't know what to say. And perhaps I have nothing to say because James O'Brien has said it all. Now, for those of you who are still, let me see, have your heads in the toilet or perhaps are lacking brain cells that would make you intelligently come to the conclusion that the rest of intelligent human beings can come to, well, continue reading the Daily Mail and continue believing the things that you believe in. Because it's people like you that are giving us the world that we're living in. And perhaps uh, people like me still have to continue trying to put the truth out there. Now, here is the thing, though. So 
who wrote this fantasia, this, 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 this fantasy that was able to connect the dots somehow? Cameron Roy. Cameron, I don't know what kind of party drugs you probably inhale or you're still inhaling perhaps or, or, or what fantasy you had to dig a hole into or drop to your head somewhere in Alice in Wonderland in order to con conf <laughs> I can't even right now. So Cameron Foy, who joined the Mail on Mail Online in September 2023 on the graduate trainee scheme. He then spent three months, this is all on Mail Online, by the way. He then spent three months at the Scottish Daily Mail in Glasgow on placement there. He previously worked at the press and journal or journal newspaper in Aberdeen. Oh, I've been to Aberdeen. And enjoys writing stories about Scottish politics. Cameron, why don't you stick to Scottish politics? politics. But you see, this is not the first time that um, dear Cameron has, 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 has written about the Sussexes, particularly about Megan. So he wrote, um, let me see one of his, a, a few of, of, of the headlines here. Is Megan Markle obsession with Gwyneth Paltrow goop the inspiration for her upcoming lifestyle brand? The Duchess' previous project, the TIG, was inspired by the 250 million wellness juggernaut, which sold this smells like my vagina candles. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. Next headline. Does Meghan Markle have the worst judgment of anyone in the entire world? Following claim by Princess Diana's former confidant, Tina Brown, we recall her questionable calls. And there's plenty to choose from. <laughs> Cameron, I'm sure there's plenty of your judgment calls that we can choose from. Uh, who cares about the, 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 the Wessexes or whatever? Don't care. Next one. The exam that put straight A student Meghan Markle in her place. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Should I read that again? Let me reread that again. The exam that put straight A student Meghan Markle in her place. Oh, Cameron. Oh, Cameron. After an internship in Argentina, she thought she was destined for a career in the U.S. diplomatic service, but failed the exam. So could you pass it? I actually can answer that question, Cameron, because I took it. Yeah, I did. And I didn't pass it. You see, the exam is pretty, I mean, it's not probably the same exam, but I took, I took it an exam similar for foreign service. And the exam is geared towards, I would say, people who have the mindset of a lawyer. Like if you're a lawyer or you have that mindset, you will do really good on this, this type of exam. Because the questions that they ask you, they're quite tricky. And for anyone that has sort of like a, a softy of a heart or, or kind of like, you know, there's certain things that are, you know, John stole an apple, but he stole an apple because he wanted to feed his baby sister that didn't have anything to eat for the last five days. And, you know, John shows up at the doors of the embassy. Would you open the gate so John can come in? Now, for some people with a heart, we would say, well, of course, yes. He's, he's just a little boy trying to, whatever, it's, it's just an apple. Well, technically you shouldn't open the gate because he's committed a crime and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, to answer your question, I didn't pass it. And many of my friends didn't either. The only one who did is the one who's a lawyer right now.
Mm -hmm. Yes. What's next? Let's see. Have Harry and Meghan moved on from their matchmaker? Harry's childhood pal, Violet Van Westenholt, who introduced them to his future wife eight years ago, seems to have disappeared from their lives. Cameron, Cameron, get closer. Cameron, listen. I know. Sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. But Cameron, this is not good. It's not good. Really not good. Why don't you write something about Scottish politics instead? And every time they ask you to write something about the Sussexes, you just say, sorry, I don't think I can. Just do it. Because this is not good. In Britain, there is a saying often whispered in the quiet, hollow halls of power. What happens behind closed doors stays behind closed doors. This phrase has reverberated through centuries of British aristocracy and establishment. Where once inside, secrets are never meant to be spoken of. The latest revelation surrounding Archbishop Justin Welby resignation and his silence over the abuse of children in church circles serves as yet another harrowing reminder of how far these institutions will go to protect their own, leaving real people, the vulnerable, the voiceless, to bear the cost. It's a bitter, painful irony that echoes through these historic walls. For years, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have borne the full weight of this institutional silence. Their so-called crime was speaking out, telling the truth of what happened behind palace walls. A transgression seen as unforgivable. They pulled back the curtain on an institution that demands silence. They refused to play the role of obedient players in a system that feast on secrecy. And for that act of defiance, they became the target and still are. Yet here we are. The same media pundits, the same established figures who spend countless hours dissecting and denouncing every breath that Harry and Meghan take, now stand on their soapbox, shocked, demanding accountability for the church's failure to protect its young and vulnerable. But where was the outrage when similar stories surfaced within the British elite? In British boarding schools, stories of abuse are woven deep into the fabric of tradition, cloaked in silence and accepted as part of a culture that teaches young boys to toughen up. British broadcaster James O'Brien and even members of the royal family, per se, you will remember Prince Harry's own uncle, Earl Spencer, have spoken of the abuse suffered in these institutions. The wounds are deep, but the conversations remain hushed. 
The echoes of these abuses travel from school corridors to palace hallways wrapped in a layer of privilege and silence. And the silence doesn't end there. There is Prince Andrew, whose controversies and associations would have buried anyone else in a life of shame and obscurity. Yet, he is welcomed back into the fold, protected, his security bills quietly handled and paid for. Why? Because he kept his mouth shut. He knew his place and didn't dare break the secret code of silence. Meanwhile, Prince Harry, who dared to speak out and reveal truths about his family and their treatment of his wife, is cast out, vilified for betraying the institution. The institution defends those who stay silent, those who follow the rules of silence, even if those rules allow rot to flourish within. Let's talk about the British media too. Figures like Angela Lavin, a woman who claims to know Prince Harry's intimately from a few hours of conversation, consistently attacks Meghan Markle with relentless venom. When confronted with her own inaction, such as her alleged knowledge of Jimmy Savile's abuse, Levin simply struck it off, distancing herself from responsibility. This is the media in action. A machine designed to protect those in power and punish those who speak up. But Harry and Meghan refused to play this game. They did what generations of the voiceless could not do. They spoke out. They shone a light into the darkness, into those dark corners of the palace, revealing truths that were meant to stay hidden. In doing so, they broke the oldest rule of all, one that the Church of England, the royal establishment, the media, and the, arist and the aristocracy cling with a vice grip. Protect the institution, no matter the cost. And so, the irony unfolds. While Archbishop Welby's resignation finally pulls back yet another curtain on institutionalized abuse, the real question remains, how many more secrets lurk in the shadows? How many more children, young men and women have suffered for the sake of silence? The British establishment contempt for Harry and Meghan wasn't merely about their departure. It was about their defiance of the culture of secrecy. They spoke when they were meant to be silent. They revealed truths that should never be uttered. This is a call to all those who have remained quiet all who feel burdened by the weight of what they know. Speak out, stand up, break the silence, because healing will only come when the truth, the full truth, sees the light of day. Institutions that claim to serve the people cannot continue to cloak their faults in secrecy and expect to strive. The cost has been too high and the silence Child. 
far too long. Innocent as starlight, veil spread against the moon. See, planted with intention, fate struggling with. Changing ground, scars, echoes for tomorrow. Love circling around. Thoughts lost in the flowers. Tales washed away. I remember.